Our final speaker for the day is Samir Goel. He's the co-founder at Austin Moms. Over the last 20 years, over the last 20 years, Samir has worn multiple hats of an engineer, product manager, marketer, and customer champion. He was the product manager for Yahoo India homepage, did product marketing for Freshdesk, and recently headed customer <coughs> success for Greater. He has now started his entrepreneur journey to make sales operations more effective in the B2B world. Here, he is here to shine some white light on customer support or customer success. So while uh, EDF has been set up, uh, I have the hard task of being the last person and you know say something new. And uh, I'm also keeping you guys from uh, lunch, I guess. So uh, just a little bit background about uh, you know myself and Austin Monks as well. Uh, Austin Monks is fairly new. We're just two months old. Uh, we are in the B2B space, and I think a lot of learning from there for that is from uh, Freshworks, where I was heading the you know customer support product, uh, and uh, we are essentially going after sales effectiveness, especially the deal closure process. So how many people here are selling through businesses and not B2C, but business products? Uh, great, a few of them. Uh, during deal closure, usually you have a code that goes out. And that, what we have found out, is a fairly painful process that you would like to kind of optimize on. Uh, it's part of a larger category called code to cash where uh, you know, we start with a code and then you end up with cash in your uh, bank. So a uh, piece of that is the quotation process itself. Uh, we are not uh, targeting the India market, we are targeting the US market. Uh, and uh, that will be where our first uh, you know, customers potentially will be. We are very early, just two people at this point of time, you know, just uh, starting with doing high uh, trying to raise some seed fund, etc. And whatever I'm going to speak about more is from my experience in the previous companies, as well as uh, you know, a lot of uh, reading and whatever I've heard from other leaders. Uh, what I want to start with is uh, you know is value proposition, and this video is a little bit about that. And from there, I will probably move to you know the topic that I wanted to kind of talk about. The idea that was here was uh, something that sort of also touched upon is uh, you have to be very clear about what is it that you're bringing to your customer, right? Uh, value proposition. So when you look at value proposition, it's a promise that you're making to your customer that this is what I will deliver to you. This is what will, you know, uh, I'm building and therefore this is why you should buy my product. Now, when you look at customer success, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about why, what it is, and so this is the delivery of that outcome to your customer. Like, uh, for example, with Tom Broker, if it is, you know, Nobody will be involved, it will be a seamless process and you will get a home. Uh, that is the delivery of the value. With Tanish, it is about, you know, I will be, it's not just about the jewelry because jewelry is just the vehicle there. There is more to it. I will be able to, you know, stand out because I am, you know, wearing that piece of jewelry in wherever I am. So if I'm not able to do that, then the whether it is from Tanish, whether it is from, you know, piece of or wherever, that value will not be delivered. Uh, so, why I wanted to tie both value proposition and customer success is because for any retention, if the person is not deriving the value that they were supposed to derive, they are not going to stay with you. They will go elsewhere to see if they can find that value. Right? So it is important for you or for anybody to ensure that whatever you promise to your customer is actually being delivered. Uh, my apologies that this is a little hard to read, but a lot of times people confuse customer support to customer success. You know, there are, I have been part of a customer, success, a customer support product and I have you know, managed a customer success function as well. They are very, you know, two different sides of a coin. I'm not saying customer support is not important, but it's not enough or it's not the complete piece. Customer support is usually reactive, that somebody has a problem and then you're reacting to that situation. Customer success is far more proactive, you have to start 
you know, as soon as the sale is made, as soon as the customer has come to you, and that's where customer success starts. Uh, customer support is seen as a cost function because you know that is something that uh, uh, you are spending money on so that uh, your uh, customer you know uh, uh, gets value. Customer success is actually a revenue line function because it has to kind of uh, uh, go to a point where you have to do cross sell, you have to do upsell. Like for example, again I'll probably take a thousand cases if somebody has come and bought a necklace. Can you upsell them to buy the earrings? Can you upsell them to buy a ring? You know, to go along with. They came with one. So how do you increase or maximize the value? Uh, with no broker, it could be not just about the home, but the other services remaining that you know uh, around the uh, moving and packing, as well as uh, insurance potentially, so on and so forth. So how do you increase value for the customer? Uh, it in the B two B world today, it is also said that. You should have a customer success person probably even before you have a salesperson because it is important for the person to see value very quickly if they don't if they are not the ones who are you know uh, happy with you then they will not refer you to more customers and uh, you know un unlike the consumer world where you are trying to acquire customers in hordes b2b is slightly slower process it is you know you take time from one customer to the other and you have to ensure that Whatever customer you have first becomes your best advocate, becomes your best mouthpiece to kind of get you more customers. The value that they bring in is just phenomenal. So, but customer success can be a process. It does not have to be, you know, there is a process that you can follow when it comes to customer success that you start on the day that you get that customer in one form or the other, whether it is a trial that they are doing for your product or whether they have bought the product from you, that is when you start engaging them. You try and understand what was their motivation to buy the product. Uh, in the jewelry case, to look good. In the home case, to move in quickly. Like, what are the other things that you want to kind of do around it so that they get value out? Who is really the decision maker? Because a lot of times, uh, for example, if you are uh, making products for kids, the decision makers are not the kids but the parents. So what does it mean for the parent? Or uh, in case of if you're buying something for your for your parents, you may they may be the consumer or they may be the user, but you are the buyer. So what does it mean for who is the decision maker? What do they value? How do they see it? In a lot of businesses, you may buy product for a function, but the CEO or the CFO is actually the one who's making the decision, and they also need to see, okay whether I was able to drive the value out of this product or not. So you have to engage them as well, not just the end consumer. Figure out how are they solving that problem today? Because if you do not have that benchmark, you will not be able to demonstrate what has been the delta or what has been the real uplift that they are seeing uh, you know, from that. Uh, the very example could be in terms of the time it takes for them to close a transaction. What was it previously? But with the payment gateway, how much has it reduced? Uh, with the no broker, uh, you know, how much time did it reduce for buying a house? Was it four months, or you know, has, has it come down to twenty days? Has it come down to five days? So how were they doing it before, and what is that measure now that they are able to see? Engage them with different kinds of material. You know, uh, there was a question around insurance uh, that uh, it is also about okay, they may not know about, it. they may not know various aspects of it. So, try and send as much content as reasonable. Uh, you know, don't bombard them, but try and send some content that helps them understand that space, best practices around it, what others are doing, you know, how you can uh, you know, differentiate, etc. So, make sure that there is some content that is going out to all decision makers and the consumer, so they start deriving more value out. Uh, it could even be around using the product itself. Uh, they may have it one use case in mind, but you can send more things so that they can start doing other things with the product. Uh, and this is very true for B two B, you know, or B two B products because while you do target one use case, there are various other use cases that you want the person to use the product for. Staying in touch proactively is extremely important, uh, irrespective of whether the frequency of buying is few days, few months, or you know. Uh, in a 
subscription model, especially the B2B SaaS world that I come from, the renewals happen over a 12 month or 15 month period. And sometimes if the contracts are longer, they will probably even happen in two years. But that does not mean that you will not engage with them because you have to figure out even during that time, are there changes that are happening in the business which will require you to adjust the product, change the product. An example I'll take here is when I was with uh, Britain, uh, we are a payroll, we were a payroll software provider, right? And fairly straightforward. One could say that uh, how many employees do you have? I will change, I will charge you based on the number of employees that you have today. Every month you tell me how many number of employees you have, and the subscription value will change. However, what happens if the customer's business changes? If they were doing business in one market, but now they are adding three or four markets, that means they they will start adding shifts. That means their operations costs will increase. That means their overhead in terms of you know who comes in at what time, what come you know uh, what benefits they have to give to people who are working in their night shift. All those have to start coming in. So if I am not engaging with them at the right time, I would not have found out that yes, their business needs are changing. Hence, my solution will change or needs to adapt, or they will go to somebody else. So, so that is very important for you to kind of, you know, keep engaging with them uh, regularly. I agree. It also depends on the ticket size. I agree. It depends, you know, whether the it's a B2B customer versus a B2C customer. Uh, but that's a judicious call that you take as to what frequency matters. But yes, keep engaging with them. Uh, you know, Saurabh pointed out very well that during that 12 to 15 month period, at different intervals, you are sending them something which keeps them engaged, keeps them informed that yes, this is coming. Uh, I'm sure you know that is true for Tanishk as well and various other uh, players as well. Uh, getting feedback, whether it is through a NPS survey, uh, customer success world relies a lot on NPS rather than CSAT because uh, the the reason that customer success works is to create advocates. If uh, how many of you have here bought an iPhone or use of you know an iPhone? Uh, and uh, if anyone of you could tell me why did you buy it or you know what prompted that purchase? Okay. And was it only from the website that you or their promotion material that you saw it, or uh, did you see somebody else actually using it and? Enjoying it, and then that pushed you in this direction. Yeah, I saw my using it. Exactly. So there have to, and this is true whether you're bought a bike, whether you're bought a car, whether, and sometimes even a home. Like you, you reach out to people and find out, oh yes, this locality is good. This is has, this is uh, you know things come over this side. Uh, for a phone, uh, I own a Xiaomi phone. For me, I saw other people deriving the value for money for it. So therefore, it was important for me to kind of buy it as well. Sometimes an ecosystem plays in into our purchase decision, right? So an advocate is very, very important in the buying cycle. Uh, a lot of times I've seen that uh, when you're buying a car or a vehicle, you will go to Team BHP and look at what are, what are the comments and what are people telling about it before you make the purchase. So that is important. So NPS is about essentially is, are you likely to recommend our service to somebody else? Right? That, that's the basic fundamental of NPS or net promoter score. Who are your promoters? Who are your advocates? So using that is a very good uh, you know, tool to understand whether the value is being derived enough for me to recommend it to somebody else and uh, you know, use that. Uh, Abhishek touched upon this and you stole my slide, but uh, you know, customer onboarding is key. Uh, that spend as much time as possible on the onboarding or make it as seamless as possible because if that process is good there is a higher likelihood that the customer will stay with you. If the onboarding process is cumbersome that's when you have sown the seeds of somebody churning up. For example if you have gone to a store if the salesperson is not treating you well or has not asked you the right questions you, will, you may make the purchase but you will not go back because the experience was not good. Uh, same is with an app that you have. If you are using an app and you're trying to kind of get to the point where you start seeing value, if there are too many steps or too much information or you know too many things that are going wrong, 
you probably either will stop or you will go but not come back. So in customer onboarding as a process is key and it can be engineered. You can think about, okay, what are the things that I want from this person? What are the things that I want when? Do I need all the information up front or can I show them you know, some value initially and get more later? A great example here is LinkedIn. You, know, you can start very quickly, but it keeps telling you that if you are, you know, your percentage profile fill is this much and you are among the rock stars or you are among this much and that much because it keeps prompting you to do give more to get. So that is a way to kind of, you know, engage an audience and get uh, them to do that. So as I said, uh, the whole purpose of customer uh, success, etc., is to create advocates. And, and a lot of times I'm asked this question is, you know, who owns customer advocacy? Is it just the customer success team or is it the marketing team? Because uh, the marketing team is doing a lot of the case studies, etc. I think customer advocacy has to be in the DNA of the company. Uh, everyone should be working, take whatever it takes to kind of convert customers into advocates. Uh, the ownership from a customer success point of view is to you know get that advocate ready and the marketing will use those messages or will convert that into collateral etc that can be used by anybody else um, and you know whether it is a case study whether it is a testimonial whether it is a video whether it is you know uh, a review that is there on a google site all of them everyone should be prompting your customers in some way or the other to get you there because every function benefits the more customer advocates you have, the easier it is for a sales guy to walk into a room and open a conversation and say that, look, this guy said this about us, that guy said this about us, and hence, you should listen to us, right? Marketing also uses it because they are, okay, there are so many other logos that we have on our website, on, you know, as customers, all are happy with us, hence we are credible, you should try us out. So each and every function that is there and, you know, benefits from the customer advocacy process, having the right testimonials, having the right you know uh, case studies. But who makes for a good customer advocate? It, a misconception here is it's your happiest customer that makes for a good customer advocate. Actually, no. It's your most engaged customer that makes for a uh, advocate because they are the ones who are going to be pushing. They are the ones who are going to ask for more. They will use you, you know, your, use your product, but they will still, you know, ask that, okay, this is not good, fix it. That is not working, fix it. If they are having those kind of conversations with you, means they are invested, they are invested in your success, and hence they will make for good advocates, because if you deliver for them, they will be the best mouthpieces that you can have out there. It does not have to be always the happy customers. But as, you know, depending on how your engagement with them is, they will become those. So, and early customers are like that. Uh, you may not have a completely perfect product, but if they are you know, providing you with feedback that okay, this is what you can do differently, this is how it will benefit, they are the ones who you should be kind of nurturing more and bringing out more. So some of this has already been talked about, uh, you know, pretty much at the fag end of the presentation as well. But surprise your customers for their loyalty. A uh, couple of examples that I can give here is, uh, you know, I am a big basket customer and there was a time during Holi when I had uh, kind of uh, made a purchase from big baskets. Uh, what they said, they sent along was a hamper of Holi, you know, the colors and some Gujia and all that stuff. They didn't have to do it, but because I was a regular customer, they did that. A lot of times in Uber today, I see that I, you know, I book an Uber Go, but they upgrade me to a, you know, a Uber Premium. Because that's that's how they reward your loyalty. This has been used a lot of times in the hospitality industry or the airline industry, where you know you are upgraded to the next uh, room or you are upgraded to the business class sometimes because you are a frequent flyer with them. So surprise, you're not. It's not expected. You're not. You know. Uh, you're not uh, kind of using your points or anything. But sometimes they still do it for you. So that's how you surprise them. Uh, how many of you are here uh, users of a fitness tracker or a Fitbit? Uh, Any one of them? Okay. So Fitbit does this very well that it kind of 
uh, you know, provides you feedback that once, when you start using the product, once you've taken the first 5,000 steps, it will send you a notification telling you that you have reached the 5,000 step mark, milestone. When you do the 10,000 one, 15,000 one, it keeps kind of giving you feedback that you are doing better and better, you are, you know, uh, getting better and better, and hence, you kind of try for more. So, they, tell, they say that, okay, you have reached the huge kind of climb five stories today. Next time, try 10. Next time, try 25. It's kind of, it gives you a little bit of motivation to do that next bit to move forward. Uh, again, LinkedIn is an example that I was using earlier. That's a, that's a kind of uh, gamification as well, where they are trying to tell you that if you provide me more information about yourself, the value that you can derive from the product is higher. So they don't want all of it at the same time, but it keeps coming. You keep trying to get to that 100% profile you know, uh, that you want there, and then they will try and convert you into a premium customer. That if you are a premium customer, if you pay, then there is a lot more. So there is a journey to how you can kind of get there. We were discussing about incentivizing the customer, you know, cash back, etc. I think uh, it depends on how you structure it. But a lot of times, the amount that is spent to incentivize customers to either get more customers is lower than acquiring them afresh. Uh, and that is why the Ubers have the referral codes and all those things. Uh, also, from an advocacy perspective, if there is somebody that you can pay to kind of put a review on Google for you in some form, I'm not saying cash, but it could be that I could give you the next, uh, you know, next purchase off at a 10% discount, or these many loyalty points will be thrown in if you are kind of uh, doing something for us on a review site, whether it is uh, a Google review, whether it's Facebook, testimonial, or B2B sites, whether it's a G2 crowd or a soft, you know, software suggest, so on and so forth. So it is okay, in my view, to incentivize your existing customers to either get more customers or help you in some form through testimonials or other fact, you know, things to kind of you know get get access to more customers. So just a few parting thoughts. Uh, you know, customer success today is viewed as the third domain change. And when I said third, sales used to be considered as the first growth engine. Marketing became the second growth engine. And customer success today is the third growth engine. That the more you can get from your existing customers is of more value. It's not an organization or a department in the function uh, in, in the company. It is a mindset that everyone has to have within an organization to strive for the customer getting the value that they, that you promised them, and that's how customer success really works. And in your onboarding process, have that clear aha moments that, yes, this happened. I was able to get it. You know, if that happens, the customer is probably potentially going to stay with you for far longer. So that's all I had. Hopefully, I you know kept this all easy. But questions? Either I was too boring or everything went over the head. <laughs> cool, I'm around, so if there are questions people want to ask, I you know network, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Samir. Uh, with this, we close our first edition. Thank you for your active and enthusiastic participation. We look forward to inviting you for all our upcoming events as well. A special thank you to our speakers for gracing our talk event with deep and uh, valuable insights and helping us make our debut a great success. Lastly, we are grateful. Uh, we are we are grateful to all of you. Obviously, yes. Thank you for coming here. We are grateful to our partners as well, NASCOM and NIPP, for all their support. Uh, so we uh, please uh, please do check out our social media handles for latest updates on events or otherwise for marketing uh, tips as well. Uh, you can check out our uh, pay money blog also. And uh, you may now proceed for lunch. Uh, please walk towards the canteen that is uh, outside and to your left. And if any of you all are looking for a payment gateway, uh, all of us are here, you can talk to us. Uh, we have our product guys as well as marketing guys. Uh, if you have any questions, we are free to take that as well. Thank you all.